Aliens on the Ocean by Anonymous Spring break has always been one of my favorite times of the year. As a child, I used to vacation to the ocean or sometimes even Disney World, and now, as an adult, my wife and I go on holidays together when the children are out of school for spring break. So, for me, there is no better place than the ocean at night. The way the moonlight glows and the waves of the water and the sound of the waves crashing always give me peace of mind. This year, my wife and I saved some extra money and rented a private house on the ocean. It was amazing. Drinking my coffee on the sea every morning and enjoying an alcoholic beverage every night as the moon rose was genuinely unique. One day, I passed out on the beach for a couple of hours only to awaken with horrible nightmares. They were strange, and I only remember darkness and a lot of screaming. My wife asked me if I was okay, and I said yeah, I was just a little shaken up from my dream. My wife went to bed early that night, but I couldn't sleep. It had to be that long nap I had taken earlier in the day, or maybe the horrible nightmares that woke me up from the nap. I wanted to clear my head, so I walked to the ocean. As I was walking on the lonely beach, I approached something that appeared to be glowing in the sand. I started to come quickly but with caution. I wanted to see what it was, but I was also nervous. It was some sort of like glowing red ball. It's hard to describe, but I'll do my best. It didn't look like cheap plastic. It was a glowing red ball of light with no shape. I stared intently until it flashed so bright that it knocked me down on the sand. This, this flash was almost like a force. The ball flew up in the air and shot itself out into the ocean, and as it reached to the horizon, there was a massive blast of light. Within seconds, the sky looked like it was storming, but there was no rain. I saw all sorts of colors in the sky and a lot of red flashes that I could only describe as looking like heat lightning, but these flashes were lighting up the entire sky. As I watched all the intense moments of light before I knew it, I blacked out completely. The next thing I remember is my wife waking me up the following day in a frantic panic because she didn't know where I was. I tried explaining what I had witnessed, but she said I was dreaming and was upset that I was wandering off at night accusing me of getting drunk and passing out. But it's important to note that I don't get drunk and I would never just wander off and never come back. Something I can't explain happened that night. Can someone let me know if they have any idea what I experienced? Could it just be a vivid dream and some sort of sleepwalking? Or did I actually notice and witness some sort of alien activity over the ocean? Something is in the ocean by squid vicious usna being in the navy you get to see a lot of the world and with two deployments currently under my belt i have seen a lot of crazy things however this occurred during my last deployment and it's a moment that i will never forget not just because it left me physically shaken but because there was no explanation for what we saw that night. I watched from midnight to four in the morning, and my watch station is in a little area right behind the bridge. In this area, I was the supervisor of a small team of four others, ensuring they did their job correctly, which was to make sure we knew where other ships were, who they were, and where they came from. The midnight watch is usually dull, as nothing really happens around that time. The bridge team tended to keep to themselves around that time and only came to bug us when they had questions about a ship or any possible ships in the area. We had one person out on the bridge to talk to the lookouts and people stationed around the ship who made visual reports to the bridge on other boats or any marine life near us. To ensure I knew what the lookouts were reporting, I hooked up a speaker to the station that guards used to talk to each other and make reports. Usually, during this time, the lookouts like to talk about nonsense and gossip amongst each other, although I will admit a lot of their conversations were funny. On this particular night, however, one of the lookouts made a report to the bridge, and I knew something was wrong because she sounded highly nervous. Here is the initial statement. Bridge, Port Fantail? Go ahead, Port Fantail. Bridge, the, the water behind us is, uh, glowing. Say again? I can't explain it any other way, but the water is glowing. 
What the hell? I said to myself. I went out to the bridge and talked to my guy ensuring he also heard what I heard. We both reported it to the junior officer of the watch or the J-O-O-W and he thought it was weird as well but claimed that it might be bioluminescent algae. Although uncommon, it did make sense to me. I told my guy to return the word to lookout hoping it would calm her down. As I returned to my station, I heard the lookouts talking through the speaker, teasing and making fun of her reporting glowing algae. After that, all seemed normal. About 20 minutes later, I heard the lookout come out again, talking to one of the other lookouts. Starboard Fantail, Port Fantail. Yeah? Do you see the water glowing in the distance? Uh, yeah, what about it? I think it's following us. <laughs> You're stupid. No, no seriously, look, look, look at it. We passed it about 20 minutes ago. We shouldn't be able to see it anymore. You're either really tired or paranoid. You need to calm down. After that, the lookout again reported it to the bridge and this time to the J-O-O-W, told him to pass the word to inform him that the glowing algae was getting closer. I went outside to check it out and even I saw it. Although it could be nothing, I was on edge. Then, out of nowhere, I know the glow rapidly was getting closer to the ship coming in from behind at a speed that made no sense for it to be algae. I ran back inside and heard the lookouts making the report, but before I could inform the bridge, the water around the ship started to grow intensely. The glowing faded slowly, then got brighter every few seconds, and everyone on the bridge was utterly dumbfounded. No one moved or spoke a word. They just stood in place watching as the bridge filled in and out with this ominous green glow. This went on for a couple of minutes, but felt like an eternity. I don't know what the others were thinking, but I thought this was the end. We then watched as whatever was glowing beneath the ship slowly moved away from us, moving ahead of us. Then, in a sudden flash of light, it was gone entirely. Everyone on the bridge remained silent for about another minute, and even though everyone was shaken up, we all tried to get past it, and many went on like it never happened. Since there was no official report of the incident and it was never passed down to the other watches, this event technically only happened to those who witnessed it, which happens more than you would think out in the open ocean. The captain should have been informed of what happened. I have not been able to stop thinking about that day and I haven't told anyone about it, not even my wife and family. Not because they won't believe me, but because they worry about me constantly when I'm out at sea. So I've kept it to myself until now. I wanted to share what I experienced and pass the word on to the swamp that there is something in the ocean. What is it? I don't know. And that truly terrifies me. Lights Over the Ocean by Star Roving 2 I was walking down the main path through the bluffs a little before 5 a.m., and I caught from the corner of my eye at first a glimpse of the ocean. I could see the full moon was casting a beautiful beam of yellow light down at the water through the hole in the clouds. I was staring at it for a while as I walked and then I noticed what looked to be something like a swarm of fireflies winking around the light. The only weird thing was is these were way out over the ocean and above the horizon. There were seven or eight and they would flash on and off they were yellow and red, but they never seemed to be in the same place twice. Unfortunately, on the bottom parts of the path, the ocean was obscured by the bluffs, so by the time I was near the bottom, I convinced myself the lights must have been buoys that I had never noticed before. When I reached the bottom, however, something I would guess was the size of a basketball flew about 50 feet over my head and lit up bright white and winked out as it hit behind the bluffs. It could have been heat or lightning, but whatever flew over me stopped for just a second. For what it was worth, when I paddled out, I did see the blinking lights of two buoys that I did know of. However, these were clearly below the horizon in the same spots they had always been. I'm sorry if my story wasn't very long and wasn't super exciting, but this is something that I have held on to for quite some time. I don't know if I just witnessed a freak of nature or something natural but it almost seemed like I might have witnessed something otherworldly going on above the ocean. My Stories While Sailing by SDS19 I've been sailing for four decades now. 
Mainly, I sail alone. I like to go out and just enjoy the ocean as well as do a fair bit of fishing. I have a smaller boat for such things, nothing fancy or big, but big enough to get around and be comfortable enough to sleep in during the short stints that I would sleep. In all my years of boating around and sailing the Atlantic, I've never had an encounter quite like the one I found myself in during the trip I'm about to speak on. First off, being that I sail alone, I generally don't sleep for very long. Depending on where you're at and the preparations you make, you can sometimes get some real sleep on the sea. But I've always trained myself to sleep no more than two hours at a time, as I've always been worried I'd wind up off course, or worse. I'm familiar enough with the ocean, I've comfortably slept here and there for eight hour periods, but I've tried to make no habits out of that, because it's definitely not safe to do so. That's a long story though, and I'm getting a bit sidetracked. Anyway, for the purposes of keeping my identity private, from henceforth just call me Dave. The ocean is a beautiful place and in my opinion, it's a world of its own. Sail the seas long enough and you'll find that when on land, you're itching to go back out again. For me, having done this sort of thing for most of my life, it has gotten to the point I consider the ocean my home. Life on land is all right but there's nothing like the thrill and adventure of the unexpected. The ocean provides that in spades. On this occasion, I had been out at sea for about a week. It was late May in 2012 and I was fishing and relaxing. The days had been good to me and I was grateful for another opportunity to be out on the ocean, taking some vacation time off work. The day went wonderfully and the week was coming to an end. I would need to head back in a few days to make sure I got home on time to be there for all of my obligations. Night had eventually fallen, and the forecast called for high winds and unsettled ocean, with some rain. This is nothing I'm not used to handling, but I decided to try to make it through the night and the storm before attempting to sleep. Everything was calm till about 9pm, when the sun had completely set itself and the storm had actually come upon me to the point that I felt like I was in some sort of movie. The waters were rough and the storm certainly made its presence known to me. This didn't bother me in the slightest and I was fully prepared to handle myself until I heard her voice. I lost my wife to brain cancer roughly seven years prior to this event. She was the love of my life and I had been with her for over 30 years when she passed. She used to go with me on my lengthy excursions out to the ocean and she was and is the only woman I would ever and ever will want in my life. The voice I heard was my wife's. I'm positive of it. I was wide awake and this happened, and at the first bolt of lightning I swore I saw her, like you might see someone standing just in the distance. She looked real, and she seemed to be trying to tell me something. I obviously was very perplexed, and I thought initially that maybe sleep deprivation was getting to me. I remember refocusing and looking around me, only to realize that the wind was picking up immensely. My radio was beginning to dip in and out, and my boat was beginning to be slammed. Keep in mind, as I said earlier, my vessel is nice and fully capable of handling the waters, but it's also smaller, and only now did I realize the storm was much stronger than the initial forecast said it would be. I didn't panic as the weather taking a sudden turn is fairly common. That said, I did try to radio out, and as I did, I got nothing. The next thing I knew, I looked up in time just to see a large surge of water hit my boat and knock me off my feet. I tried to turn the boat, but it was too late. Before I knew it, my boat was flipped and I was thrown into the ocean. I remember trying to get my head above water, popping in and out, taking short breaths before BAM! I was hit by another massive wave and being dragged under. I fought with all my might and fury, swimming to the surface again. Gasping for air, I looked up and saw my wife. I could faintly make out two words. Keep swimming. I know how crazy this sounds. On instinct, I trusted my wife's voice and I swam in her direction. I had no way of knowing for sure if this was really her or how it was even possible. But in my heart, something told me to keep swimming her way. I was hit with another blast of water from the ocean. Everything was backward. Up was down, down was up. I truly felt like I was I was lost. Still, I pressed on swimming with every bit of strength I had. Looking out and gasping for air, I could see my wife once again. She wore the red dress she wore the night we celebrated our 30th anniversary. I just remember 
focusing on her and not really thinking about anything else but trying to keep afloat. The truth is, reflecting back later, part of me did wonder if I died there would I be reunited with her. Still, in the moment, I was too focused on her image and survival to give up. I pressed forward and swam with all of my might. If it weren't for her guiding image and her voice, I'm sure I would have been completely lost. I went under and would lose my way but would always be able to follow her voice. I probably would have swam circles until I died. Thankfully, as I got closer to my wife, I felt a renewed vigor well up within me. It was because of her, and to this day I can't explain how, that I'm still alive. I swam in her direction for what felt like forever, and I'm sure at least was an hour until she faded. She faded before me within a few feet. She was close enough that I could reach out, but upon trying to touch her I only saw her sweet smile, and then she faded. Instead of her skin, I felt the water of just a few feet further in front of me. My boat was sitting upright again, bobbing around in the ocean. I was able to reclaim my boat soon after. The storm died down. And honestly, I'm not really expecting anyone to believe me. But that night, I believe my wife saved me from beyond the grave. I can't explain it. I don't know if it was her ghost, my mind playing tricks on me and using her image to keep me... I don't know if she was a ghost my mind playing tricks on me and using her image to keep me going, like some kind of weird survival trick, or if it was something else entirely. But to this day, that is the strangest and most dangerous thing I have ever done on the ocean. The trip back home was uneventful. I never heard my wife's voice or saw her again or ran into any other storm or problem. I still go boating today on the ocean, but I wouldn't have been able to survive that night without her there. I won't pretend to know how or why it happened but I'm thankful it did, and I hope when God finally does decide it's my time that she'll be waiting for me in the afterlife. A Boating Nightmare by Anonymous This particular story is possibly the most traumatic week of my life. Sounds dramatic, I know. I'm already questioning whether or not I even want to put this out there. My name is Kira. I had a lot of issues with my parents growing up, but they always seemed to trump my feelings of uncertainty with annual trips to the Caribbean. Being from Canada, I always enjoyed the palm trees and vibrant aquamarine of the sea, but mostly I enjoyed the week-long break from the bullies at my elementary school. I felt lucky. I knew I had an opportunity many kids in my class did not. More than anything, though, I was just happy to have something good in my life. My parents were the type to take me on vacation, get me beers at the age of 10, and tell me about all the crazy stuff they did growing up. However, I was not allowed to have male friends, I was physically abused for the minor mistakes that I made, and my emotional needs were ignored. It's not relevant to the story, so I won't go to much more detail but I was left with the impression that I constantly needed to impress and suck up to my parents if I wanted their love and attention, especially my dad. I tried so hard for him. I tried to impress him to this day, but I can't help it. My parents took me to the Dominican Republic during March break for this particular vacation. I was seven years old and this was my first trip overseas. We stayed at a resort on the waterfront of a popular tourist spot. We spent most of our days there on the beach I was a fantastic swimmer and loved the water at the time. You had to drag me out of it practically. Nothing could break my spirit, nothing could scare me, I thought. I always considered my parents to be somewhat responsible. They were so strict I just thought it was because they were trying to protect me and do what was best. Looking back though, I get angry at how wrong I was. On the second day of our trip, my father walked me down to the beach. From what I can remember, we ended up at a boat rental area. They had kayaks and other small boats, what they called kayaks I guess, but these weren't kayaks. They were more like paddle boards. They were primarily flat and you sat on them rather than in them. My dad essentially told me to get the kayak and be safe and don't mess around with the paddle board. While dragging me out in one of these kayaks and pushing me into the water, a young girl around my age approached me, asking if she could join. I was practically conditioned into subservience, so I allowed it. We rode around in the shallow waters until she noticed some big waves out on the horizon. 
she insisted we go out there. I was scared, and I knew it was dangerous and a bad idea. But I've never had anybody convince me of doing something I didn't want to do, really. So, against my better judgment, we rode out there. And slowly but surely, we approached waves taller than the two of us combined. We immediately realized our predicament and attempted to turn around, but it was far too late. A ten-foot wave flipped our tiny boat and flung us into the sea. The waves crashed over me repeatedly. All I could do was see the bottom of the ocean for a while. I remember thinking it was beautiful. I couldn't stay, though. I had to do something. The waves were still coming at me with my head finally above the water. I couldn't see anything over them, and I felt myself dragged beneath. Finally, I saw the girl. I hated her, and I didn't want to help her. Then I saw the boat. Both were maybe 20 feet away in opposite directions. I swam harder than ever towards the ship. Tears were streaming down my face. I eventually got us back onto the kayak, and our oars were nowhere in sight. We used our arms to paddle us forward, and after some time, what felt like an hour, maybe even more, we were back in the calmer waters, where we found one of our missing oars. We used it to get back to shore as quickly as possible. Upon arriving on the beach, we both ran back to our parents. At least I assume that's where she went, as we never saw each other again. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end there. Even after relaying that and all of what happened to my parents, they didn't seem to even get the hint that I should be supervised. I wasn't a bad kid, but as a seven-year-old in a foreign country, you'd think they'd be more cautious. A couple of days later, I walked down to the beach by myself, where an older gentleman approached me. He had a strange accent and asked me how old I was. I told him, though, I was genuinely creeped out by him. I felt like I had to answer his questions. He was an adult and was therefore in charge. He then asked me if I would hang out with his son, Frederick. I still was nervous, but I reluctantly said yes. I was scared of this man, but at the same time, I wanted another kid to play with as I was lonely. He took me to him, who, to his credit, was real. I hadn't been tricked or lured, and all my worries instantly melted away. Frederick and his father were visiting from Poland, and Frederick and I bonded, talking about our home countries, interests, and absent parents. I then learned that Frederick was 13. This concerned me, though. Not as much as it should have, probably. Being only 7 years old, I knew that he was what was considered at my school a big kid. When you're a kid, a 6-year difference really is a lot. It feels like they have as much control over you as an adult. But we got along great so I had no reason to think of him as anything other than a friend. We continued to hang out for several days. We would meet up at a specific spot on the beach, and we would talk and play in the sand. We never really went in the water. We would chat and explore the coast. It was a lot of fun. I liked Frederick. On the third day we met up, we played around in the sand. By this point, I noticed his father was never around. I had only ever seen him the first day when he approached me alone. I didn't think much of it. Frederick suggested we go into the water. As someone who loved the ocean, I was more than happy to oblige. I was honestly waiting for this. I loved the sand, but I wanted to swim. We went in the water talking and laughing, except he kept moving further and further out to sea until I eventually couldn't touch the bottom. He was more than a foot taller than I was, so I assumed he didn't realize I couldn't feel him anymore. But then, his whole demeanor changed. We were facing each other. I was facing the shore, and he was facing the open ocean. He was blocking my path back to the beach, though this wasn't a concern at the time until he started acting weird. Nothing leading up to this point would have led me to believe he was a threat. He asked me about my body and if I had ever seen a guy's private parts. Thinking this was a joke, I said no. He then asked me if my parents knew where I was. I once again stupidly said no. I was getting worried out and I told him I wanted to go back to the beach. He ignored me, and then he asked, Do you want to see it? Surprisingly, at this point, I actually kind of knew what was going on, and I wasn't being an idiot for once. I tried to swim past him, but he grabbed my arm before I could say anything. He put both hands on top of my head and shoved me underwater. I was kicking and screaming, knowing no one could hear me or save me. I felt so helpless. I felt, I felt like I was leaving my body. I could see his legs, I could see the empty blue, I could see my parents, 
lying on lounge chairs half a mile up the beach, sun tanning, drinking cocktails, not a worry in the world. Anger consumed me. I was a good swimmer. I was in martial arts. I knew I could do better. I deserved a chance at life. I wanted my freedom so severely I kicked and kicked and kicked, and I kicked Frederick right in the jewels by pure chance. I somehow made it back to shore by grasping for air and swimming like I was in the Olympics. I ran to my parents, and though they questioned why I was out of breath, all I could say was, I never want to see Frederick again, and I didn't. During the last couple of days of the trip, my parents looked out for me. They never even questioned my decision to stop seeing this kid who they'd never even met. I put it out of my mind, too. I'm 24 years old now. I recently brought it up to my mother, telling her the whole story. She cried. I get it. I love my parents. Unfortunately, they didn't start paying attention to me until I no longer needed it. Camping at a park was a bad idea. By Bama Girl This happened back in 2012, in Florida. I was 22 at the time and my ex was 19. We both had fallen on tough times and ended up becoming homeless. We had no choice but to pitch a tent in the woods and do our best to survive. We lived in that tent for about a year and a half. Unfortunately, during this time we both became addicted to meth. I know, not a great story, right? It's not the best background, but it happened and there's nothing we can do about it and there is no sugarcoating addiction. We had been living in our tent for about six months at this point, and our little tent had become a pretty impressive home base that we entirely built by tweaking. We ended up with three tents with a screened-in area to keep the mosquitoes out. There was a park about a half a mile away from our camp, and every evening different churches would come to visit this park and feed the homeless. So one evening, my ex and I went to this park to get food. We had been awake for about five days at this point and were coming down, so we needed food and a lot of rest. We ended up meeting a couple at the park, and they were about our age, maybe a few years younger. They joined us at our table and told us their story and how they ended up homeless. They told us they had no tent and nowhere to go, so my ex elbowed me in the ribcage and gave me the eyes. So I asked them if they wanted to stay in our extra storage tent. They took us up on the offer, being incredibly grateful. After all, we were all homeless and we needed to take care of each other. Once we were all done eating, we packed up our leftovers and started to head back to the home base. Our little setup seemed to impress the couple when we reached the tents. I grabbed some dry wood with the boy and set up a small fire in the makeshift fire pit. We sat around the fire talking and laughing for a couple of hours, and we got to know each other better. Soon the fire turned to a smoldering ember and we decided to go to bed. I gave them some extra pillows and blankets, and we all said goodnight. I was lying in my tent in and out of sleep. It was an hour after everybody said goodnight, and at this point, I was almost delirious from the amount of time I had been awake. Then I heard a loud smacking sound. It woke me up pretty quickly. I was a bit confused because I didn't hear any voices, so I thought it must have been my imagination at first. So I laid back down. And then I heard it again, but this time much louder and this time followed by the sound of a zipper. I can hear the girl at the door of my tent pleading to come in, so I opened and invited her in. Of course I'm annoyed, but it is what it is. I gave her a pillow, then I hear the zipper in the tent once again. Now the boy is at the front of my tent, screaming at the girl to come out of my tent. She refused. So what does this guy do? He unzips my door, grabs her by the hair, and rips her out of my tent. I'm no saint, and I won't be someone to say that I have never manhandled or put my hands on my exes in any sort of situation, especially in the worst of my addiction. But that night, I didn't have the patience to deal with these two, and I was not about to stand by and watch this girl get beat down by someone three times her size. I jumped to my feet and bum-rushed the guy. I had no advantage over him at all. In all actuality, I was the same size as the girl, but I was no stranger to fights myself. I grew up with five brothers. Being the only girl, they ensured I knew how to defend myself. I made contact with the boy. He didn't see me until it was far too late, luckily. He was instantly on his back, but he got up rather quickly, and I suffered one of the worst beatings of my life. I kept pushing him away, trying not to get hit, 
and I just kept myself between him and the girl. This kid was throwing haymakers at me over and over. Every time I hit the ground, I would get back up, and he moved from my face to my ribs. But still, I would not let him get to the girls. He struck me. I wouldn't get back up. I was just bloody and battered at this point. Knowing I had some broken ribs, if things got any worse, I would probably die. And that's when I heard a, a, a screaming from the girl, who was trying to protect me from the continuous kicks to the ribs. This idiot pulls out brass knuckles that double into a pocket knife. The kid punched my ex in the chest, flipped open the blade, and tried to cut her. I saw the red come through her shirt, and I blacked out. The rest of the story is the recounting through my ex's words. I sprang to my feet and was super quiet. I looked at my ex, saw the wound, thank goodness it wasn't anything more than a surface wound, and I started walking around. I started to the side and found a log big enough to make an impact and small enough to basically be like a softball swing. I ran behind him, looked down, and stomped a stick to get his attention. I made him look at me as I softball swung at his head. He immediately crumpled to the ground. The girls were trying to make me stop at this point, but I jumped on top of him, grabbed the remaining log pieces, and repeatedly struck him in the head. I apologize if that is graphic. Once the log was nothing but splinters, I got off him, he was unconscious, and I grabbed the claw hammer from the front of my tent. I grabbed the hammer and started to scream in a demonic voice. It was almost unintelligible. I made my way to the guy, turned the hammer claw in. I raised the hammer, and as I was mid-swing, only inches from his temple... Both of the girls grabbed my arm and disarmed me. They didn't let me kill him, and uh, I thanked them all the time for that. My rage just took over. It's, I don't even know how to explain it. There was nothing they could do for my ribs. There was nothing they could do for my rib fractures, my skull fracture. Everything was, was only going to be healing in time, essentially. There was nothing the hospital was going to be able to do for it. So, instead of killing this guy, I just called the police. We waited for them to come pick him up. An EMT took me to the hospital, and I got bandaged up. We never saw that couple again, and for days after that I could barely walk as the pain was unbearable. Unfortunately, I can't really say that after this experience I was on my way to recovery. But I, I would get there eventually, of course. But it was the biggest eye-opening thing of my life. The Park That Rained Rocks By Heavy Metal Barbie This happened a few months ago. My friend, who is 23 years old and a male, and I, who is 22 years old and a female, were hanging out one Sunday afternoon. Since it was a lovely sunny day and it was near the end of fall and the cold winter was fast approaching, we decided to go to a bar or a cafe. We would get some beers and relax at the park to soak up one of the last sunny days that we would get that year. We bought some beer and snacks at the store and decided to sit on a bench at the park nearest to the store because we didn't want to walk too terribly far. The area I live in is known for having many beautiful gardens, almost next to every block of buildings. The park was tiny to give you a general idea of our surroundings. A few benches were next to a child's playground, and a basketball court was a little bit down the road. Buildings surrounded the park for the most part. Most of the area was covered in grass, but the garden was built, so underneath the swings and slides there were tiny white rocks. Little, but they were rocks nonetheless. We were the only people there for easily 10 or 20 minutes. None of the other benches were occupied, no other kids were on the playground, it was just peace and quiet. Suddenly, we noticed this man running extremely fast in our direction. At first, we didn't think much of it. Maybe he was just running after his dog or something of the like so we kept minding our business. Suddenly, he stopped abruptly as soon as he got to the playground. Now, I was a bit confused at this point, but very quickly my confusion turned into fear when I saw this man pick up a handful of rocks and throw them everywhere while making bizarre grunting noises and screaming. I looked over at my friend and told him that I wanted to leave immediately. This guy was twacked out of his mind. He said he wasn't sure if this was a good idea since the man had not noticed us yet. And if we just got up and left, he could see us and decide to attack us. We sat there for a few more minutes watching this man, hoping he would go and not notice us. But, to our luck, of course he noticed us. And as soon as he saw us, he ran exceptionally quickly, got very close to our faces, and started flailing his arms at us, still making these weird grunting noises. We just looked at each other, quickly grabbed our stuff and tried to get up. When the man noticed that he stood before me, 
blocking me from moving, he grunted in my face very loudly. His breath smelled like absolute crap. I was so scared, not knowing what to do. I am not much of a fighter, and neither is my friend. This man was indeed way more potent than us. I seriously considered just putting my cigarette out on his arm to distract him and free myself from the trap he had put me in. My friend got up and took a step toward him in an attempt to scare him off. Luckily, this worked and the man backed off a bit, just enough so I could get up and escape. As soon as I got up, we started running away as fast as we could, hoping we wouldn't be chased after. As we were running, I noticed rocks around us raining down because the man had started throwing them at us in handfuls. Luckily, none of us got hurt and we were able to get out of there unharmed. We had a few scratches and bruises, both of us were pretty shaken up after that, and we never knew exactly what his intentions were. However, we both concluded that it was pretty clear that he had some mental problems and was probably twacked out on some drugs. The Creepy Trail Guy, a Swamp Dweller Classic Story Reread, by Deadly Images. I'm a 20-year-old female, and I live in Michigan. I was 16 years old when these events happened. I am a substantial athletic nerd and go hiking on a daily basis, unless I'm feeling lazy that day. Unfortunately, I picked the wrong day to go hiking, and I met and experienced something I would not want to share or ever experience again. I wouldn't even put this on my worst enemy. I drove to my typical hiking trail. I go there just about every time I go hiking, and this day I saw a creepy guy who looked to be in his early to mid-thirties. Me being stubborn and hard-headed, I just decided to ignore them and continue jogging on the trail anyway. Typically, if you see somebody acting weird in a parking lot, especially to a trail or somewhere outdoorsy, definitely, definitely have a friend with you or at least some sort of protection. You never know what their intentions are. I took a short glance at him and started going on to the path. I got 200 to 300 yards away from the entrance and took a short break until I heard a scream. It sounded like a man was absolutely losing his mind, and then I looked down the path and my heart dropped. I saw the same guy from before in the parking lot running straight towards me, screaming. My adrenaline rushed into me, and I began to run as fast as I possibly could. This guy ran so fast that he caught up with me in no time, and I was a speedy runner. The guy ran like he had taken two shots of steroids and was a straight bat out of hell. I started to cry in panic, freaking the heck out. I quickly turned into the woods and returned to the parking lot area. I kept hearing his footsteps not too far behind me. As I kept running, the footsteps started to get slower, and I eventually was losing him. Once I made it to the parking lot and had any sense of safety again, I jumped into my car, locked all the doors, and immediately called the cops on my cell phone. Not very long after, they arrived and searched the entire area. They did eventually find the man. He was a homeless man, he was 37 years old, and they found a very big, rusted butcher knife in one of his coat pockets. I'm glad I did ROTC throughout high school, or else I would not have had the energy to be able to outrun him. He was faster than me, but my stamina was overall better. This is a short, creepy story, but it forever lives on inside of me. What Park Rangers in the Great Smokies Won't Tell You by Horror Writer 1717 I was a park ranger in the Great Smoky Mountains in Tennessee. It wasn't a bad job. The scenery was amazing. I loved to drive up Klingman's Dome Overlook and watch the sunrise. Anytime there was a thunderstorm, I headed for that overlook. One of the best things about the job is the autonomy. Being left alone to do whatever you want is kind of excellent, but it doesn't come without its downside. This park is massive, over a million acres and 11 million people visit annually. I found out the hard way why the park closes at night though. If you've never driven through the Great Smokies on a cloudy moonless night, you've never experienced true soul-crushing darkness. Do you know those extremely bright LED lights that so many trucks have on the front of their grill blind you when they drive towards you? Yeah. Our trucks don't have those. We have regular lights. The old, dull, yellow glow. 
the ones that make you wonder if your battery is going dead or if you'd be better off shining a flashlight ahead of you because you would probably see more that way. The AM radio in the Ranger truck spews out static-filled country garbage. It would be easy just to turn it off, but sometimes I feel like it's my only company on the endless black ribbon of road that runs through this sea of darkness. One thing this job gives you plenty of is time to think, and sometimes that's not always a good thing. I slam on my brakes to avoid hitting a deer. It glances at me, then continues to strut across the road in no hurry. You're welcome, I yell out my window. The deer doesn't even pause. I swear the animals around here think they own the place. <laughs> I think that with a chuckle. Just to make my life more interesting, it starts to snow. In ordinary places, that's not much of a problem. In this pitch black mountain, it could quickly become an issue. It usually doesn't snow here, but there's a call for concern when it does. Most times, it's a freak occurrence and comes fast and heavy. This time is no exception. Within minutes, the road is covered. Already low visibility has been reduced to nearly zero. And of course it starts when I'm furthest away from the station, right in the middle of nowhere. I slow to a crawl, knowing it will take me forever to get back, but at least I'll get there in one piece instead of sliding off a mountain to my fiery, gory death. I hope. I turn on my windshield wipers in a futile attempt to keep visibility. They work almost as well as the radio, honestly. The defroster and the wipers fight a losing battle against the onslaught of snow. I would just pull over and wait it out, but out here I don't want to end up buried in snow for days waiting for someone to come plow me out. Each station has one snow plow. I don't remember when it was used last. Suddenly I look out the front of the truck and remember that I am actually driving the only truck with the mount for the plow. Translation, I need to get back because there's no one coming to get me. As that positive thought rattles through my head, I come to a turn I see just in the nick of time. I have just enough time to wrench the wheel hard to the right and stay on the road. My tires and the deepening snow disagree on which way the truck is going and I end up sliding toward the edge. I jump on the brakes in a panic, causing them to join the direction argument. In the end, momentum wins. I slide closer to the rail that I know won't keep me from diving hundreds of feet to my death. I'd love to say that my life flashed before me, but all I could do was see that damn snow. I'm going to die surrounded by irritatingly blinding white snow. With nothing else to do, I close my eyes and pray. Time slows as I begin to bargain with my maker. The usual stuff, I'll be better, I'll give my life to the church, I'll become a priest, a missionary, whatever you freaking want as long as you save my life. I felt a heavy thump. This is it, I think. I'm going over the edge. As a desperate last-ditch thought, I opened my door and threw myself out into the road. I land hard, like a belly flopper on asphalt. The wind escapes my chest and refuses to come back. I lay there rocking back and forth in the cold on the white road, hoping that, by some bizarre twist of fate, someone else doesn't come along and run me over. Seconds turn to minutes as I lay there watching the snow in its relentless downpour, waiting for my breath to return. Eventually, I come around and painfully rise to my feet. The truck sits idling as if nothing has happened. I reach in and put it in park, feeling embarrassed and stupid for getting myself in such a panic. I grab my flashlight and go to the front of the truck to see the damage. I'm surprised to find the front bumper sitting four feet from the rail. I know I hit something, I say to myself, examining the fence and finding it undamaged. I turn the light to my bumper and find it's been bent slightly at the end. My light flashes back and forth between the entire guardrail and the damaged bumper. What the hell? As my brain wraps around this puzzle, another piece falls into place. I see patches of hair on the bumper and red in the snow. As I pursue the matter, I know the imprint of a large animal lying in the snow in front of my truck is probably not the best idea to investigate. I pull out my phone and take a picture. The impression it made was massive. This thing is at least as tall as the car is vast, even more significant. Great, I hit a bear. I say sarcastically. I sigh as I see the trail of red heading off into the trees beside the road. Guess I should go check on it. I return to my truck, grab my coat and the keys, then head after my quarry. The red is becoming difficult to track through the deepening snow. The tracks themselves seem odd. They're too close together. It's almost like as if this bear is walking on its hind legs. But why would it do that? Did it hurt its paw or something? I approach the edge of the woods, still following the red tracks. I don't want to go too far into the woods. I'm hoping I can catch a quick glimpse of the bear alive and well, looking a paw, but otherwise okay. 
trekking through the dark woods in a snowstorm isn't part of the plan to keep me alive long enough to retire. As I followed the tracks further, I noticed something else about them. They don't look like bear's tracks. If I would say they look like anything, I'd say more like large dog tracks. But they're way too big to be any normal dog I've ever seen. Even for a Malamute or a St. Bernard, these are massive. I step into the woods not intending to go much further, and a flash and flash the light around a little bit. I notice the path continues going slightly uphill. <laughs> nope, I say. Not tonight. I turn and head back to the truck when I hear a low, guttural growl. I slowly turn around and see red glowing eyes staring at me from behind a tree. I shine the light in the direction and see that there are tracks that lead right up to a tree that hides all but the eyes of this creature. It's massive. The eyes must be eight feet off the ground. I've never seen anything like this and I still haven't seen it. Just the eyes at this point. In my terrified stupor, I do the least likely thing possible. I pull out my phone and take a picture. The flash makes it blink, but also appears to make it even more angry. It starts toward me. I would love to say that I was calm, relaxed, and collected as I returned to my vehicle and was on my merry way, but that didn't happen at all. I screamed and turned to run, but my boots were slippery and I fell, nearly hitting my head on a rock. As I gain traction and speed, I hear heavy footsteps behind me. No need to turn and look, I know what's coming after me. Oh dear god, oh dear god, oh dear god, oh dear god. I know I'm not going to make it. I do the one thing I don't want to do. I glance back. A massive mound of fur is galloping toward me, its red eyes glowing with malice. It's coming so fast that it'll overtake me at any second. No matter how fast I try to go, there's no way I'm going to get to my truck. My panicked mind runs through a myriad of options. From just give up to turn and command it to stop to throw the flashlight hoping it will fetch it and give you time to get inside the car. The moment of truth arrives. I'm almost to the truck but I can feel its hot breath going down my neck at this point. I'll never make it around the corner. I'll try to think back to all those dinosaur movies I've seen and how they escaped. My mind reminds me that many of them ended up as a dino snack before the film was done. I sarcastically thank my brain for the happy thought and chose the one tactic that the movies always seem to show to be successful. I slid under the truck. I'm barely on the ground until I hear a loud bang. The car lurches to the side. A massive snout shoves itself far under the truck as it can, and it sniffs. I try to ease my way out from under the car, but, but the nose disappears and reappears on the other side. This time, there are also claws pawing at me, trying to get a hold of me. I shimmy away from them only to have them show up on the other side. Back and forth we go, like a demented seesaw. Front, back, sides, wherever I go, it's right there trying to grab me. After an eternity of this game, it tries something new. The paws disappear and I feel the truck springs compress. It's climbed on top of the truck. Shoot, now can see no matter where I go. I test my theory by shining my flashlight toward the back of the truck. It instantly appears and tries to shove its snout under, snapping at me. I push further toward the front. It returns to its vanguard on top of the truck. I lay as still as possible for an eternity, trying not to move, barely breathing, hoping it will lose interest in me and return to the woods. My waiting game ends when I realize the snow is almost up to the level of the truck's frame. I'm going to lose visibility soon. I know I need to do something. I come up with a desperate and stupid plan. I shine my light at the back of the truck, causing the creature to jump down and claw at me. At the same time, I dig some snow away from the front of the car to regain visibility. Then I do the same in reverse. I shine the light at the front and dig at the back. Next, I execute the most desperate and stupid part of my plan. I threw the lit flashlight toward the front of the car and it bounces near the guardrail and, for a moment, it looks like it's going to hit and bounce back. I freeze in fear as it takes one more bounce, then disappears over the side. The creature leaps down but doesn't shove its snout under the truck. It jumps the guardrail and disappears. I gasp in astonishment that my plan has worked. I lay there and marveled for a second. Then my mind kicks my ass. What the hell are you still lying here for? Get in the truck! I jump up, hitting my head on the car's underside, then roll up on the driver's side, yank on the door, and of course it's locked. I fumble with my keys just like I've seen in every horror movie ever. I wondered how those people could suddenly forget how to use a key. And now I know. After several failed attempts, I finally opened the door and threw myself inside. I started it up, slammed it into reverse, and hit the gas and nearly did a complete 360 as the tires fight for traction in the snow that has accumulated around. I take a deep breath and compose myself before giving it a little gas, just enough to get moving and get myself back on the road. This leads me to my next problem. The road is gone. 
All that remains is a blanket of white. Sweat forms on my brow as I start down the road, steering by measuring the distance of the trees to the bank spot that used to be a road. I crawl down the mountain this way, slowing to a near stop whenever there is a curve. Unfortunately, it's the Smoky Mountain, so it's all curves. An hour later, I'm no closer to the station. However, a minor miracle happens. The snow stops. I'm so ecstatic, I'm nearly jumping in my seat. I might even make it home alive. I glanced in my rear view mirror and those hopes are dashed instantly. In the distance, I see glowing red eyes, and they are getting closer. My veins turn to ice as I press down on the accelerator. After sliding through a turn, barely remaining in control of the vehicle, I realize I can't outrun it. I slow, but only a little bit. On the few straight spots in the road, I speed up, but then slow down when I get to a curve. Consecutive stretches are the only time I can afford a glance in the mirror. Each time I do, the eyes are still there, and they are a bit closer. I inch closer to the station, clinging to the desperate hope that I can make it there before this thing catches and devours me. I look at my odometer and realize I'm only five miles from the station. It might as well be a million. I sigh. As I look back and see the eyes have become considerably more significant. There's a sharp turn coming up. I know I have to slow down for it. I know that things will catch up when I do. I also know there's a steep drop off at this turn. I'm stuck. No matter what I do, it's going to end badly. I do what has to be done. I slow down enough to keep from sliding off the edge. When I straighten out, I glance back and the eyes are gone. Could it have slipped off the edge? My hopes rise and then suddenly plummet as I see the red eyes beside me. The monster is running beside the truck. It slams into the door, making a considerable dent. It hits again and shatters the window. Its snout dives in and snaps at me. As the snarling, snapping jaws of a death inch closer, I duck in... As the snarling, snapping jaws of death inch closer, I duck into the passenger seat. I do the only thing I can think of. I slam on the brakes. The unprepared monster goes flying forward as I slide to a stop. It shakes itself and stands, growling at me and baring its teeth. I jump on the gas pedal to get as much speed as possible to run it over. The truck leaps in the air as the tires pass over the massive monster. I don't slow down until I have to. After I make it through the curve, I look back and don't see the glowing eyes. I hazard a glance out the window and see nothing but snow. I can't trust the quiet. I'm so paranoid, I'm shaking, and at this point I think I'd rather see the blasted beast just to know where it was rather than this ungodly suspense. After a few minutes and many more glances back, I finally let myself relax. I'm only a mile away from the station, and I can't believe I made it. The truck explodes from impact. I feel like a bulldozer has rear-ended me. I wrestle with the steering wheel as I'm hit again. The car is moving faster even though I'm standing on the brakes. I look back and see the monster. It's pushing me. I look forward and see the guardrail crumple underneath my front bumper. The truck slides over the edge. It's not the steepest ravine in the park, but it doesn't need to be. The, the car falls end over end, then starts turning and rolling. It all happened so quickly, I never took the time to fasten my seatbelt. I'm thrown around like a rag doll. By some miracle, I stayed inside the truck. I don't know how long I was unconscious, but I woke to heavy footsteps and snarling. I'm lying sideways under what's left of the back seat. The truck is on its roof, and I'm lying in a puddle of glass and blood. The monster sticks its snout through in the shattered window and leers at me with its glowing red eyes. I try to crawl away, but my leg is bent at an unnatural anger, probably broken. Pain shoots through me as I try to use my arm to push out. Ultimately, I realize there's no escape. No fight left in me, I lay there and waited for the inevitable. It sniffs at me and drool drips from its mouth as its putrid breath assaults me. This is it. I close my eyes and wait. Nothing happens. I open my eyes and... It's gone. I painfully turn to see if it's playing some game, but I can't find it. What the hell happened to you? Says one of my fellow rangers as he sticks his face into the window. How is all I can manage? Looks like you're about to be the luckiest son of a bitch I've ever seen, he says. You must have rolled off the road up there and landed on this road down here. A few more feet and you would have been headed for another tumble. I lay there waiting for something else to happen. This is a dream, I think. I'm dreaming of being rescued while the monster chews me into pieces. Let's get you to a hospital, the ranger says. I wake up in a hospital bed. My right arm and left arm are each in a cast. It hurts to breathe. I'm pretty sure there are some broken ribs. The door opens and another ranger steps inside. I see they got you all fixed up, he chuckles. What happened to you out there? Did you fall asleep at the wheel? I think about what I should tell him. I wonder how much he would believe, and then I remember. Phone, I rasp. He reaches into the pocket and pulls out his phone. 
I shake head painfully. No, my phone. He searches through my bag with all my clothes and pulls out my phone with several cracks on the screen. Pictures, I rasp. He opens the screen and navigates to the pictures. He looks at the last one and says, Well, ain't that something, he says. I'm so glad he sees it. I can tell my story and have proof of everything I see. He turns the phone towards me. All I see in the picture is white. The flash was on. The snow wiped out the monster's image. He scrolls back to the other view of the creature's imprint, but the flash in the snow also washes it out. I'm devastated. I know what I saw and I know it's real. Isn't it? I turn away. I'll let you go so you can rest up, he says, then walks out the door. I'm not crazy, I saw it. A month later, I'm feeling a lot better. My arm and leg and ribs are all on the mend. I filled out my accident report. I didn't mention anything about a creature. My slipping caused a crash of the snowy road, and that's how I left it. I wish I could say that I've improved mentally, that I have had less nightmares, that I don't look out the window every night and see glowing red eyes staring back at me from the woods. But I can't say that, because it would be a lie. I know it's going to hunt me down one day. I know it's waiting for me. Don't Go Camping in Unmarked Forest by Riker I keep an open mind and don't say that weird things exist with certainty, like skimwalkers, Bigfoot, etc. But I do believe that it's possible. But I have to see it to believe it if you understand my drift. But now, after this experience that I've recently had, I think in an entire different way. But in Winnipeg, Manitoba, it was a relatively dull day. Nothing exciting was going on here. It could be an excellent area to visit, but I also think it's very boring. I live alone and can do whatever I want. So, ironically, I'm a wilderness person who doesn't do much work around the city. I usually find nice areas near the city, and I did the same this time. It was near southeastern Manitoba. This beautiful area is miles upon miles of dense forest. It took me much longer than I thought it would to get across and into the actual trails itself, but once I did, I immediately went off trail because I'm more of an off-grid type of guy. Not long after I went off the trail, I noticed a small house. But it was... it was weird because it was completely alone out here. When I got closer, I realized nobody was out there. Nobody at all. I was initially unsettled because I thought I would see someone, but I didn't care after some time gone by. As I got used to the weird feeling all around me, I planned to set up my two-person tent up in the clearing. It was a big clearing, so I wanted to set up relatively close to the woods. I wanted it to borderline the woods, so that's exactly what I did. I took about 20 to 30 minutes to set up everything the way I wanted it to, and then I took about 10 minutes to get some sticks for a fire. I wanted to get it going because it would be dark soon, so I also grabbed a flashlight and ensured it had fresh batteries. I walked through the tree line, jabbing myself with many thorns and branches due to the lack of sight despite having a flashlight. I eventually made it into another clearing. This one was tiny, but it had what I was looking for. Sticks and branches everywhere. I broke them into smaller pieces, sizable enough for me to carry back to the site without carrying too much. It was getting pretty dark now, and the moon was coming out. Where I typically live, there's a lot of light pollution, so you don't get to see the stars all that much. But out here, they were everywhere. It was amazing. After leaving that area and entering back into my area, my brain presented something to me. When I had left, Crickets and birds were rustling in the bushes and making all sorts of noise. But when I re-entered, there was nothing. No noise, nothing at all. It was like everything had just absolutely left or went mute. Now, like I said, I'm in the remote wilderness. I've done this quite a few times, but this was one thing that I just quite didn't know how to tackle. I've never been in a situation where everything just went mute. Even the wind. That's when I felt like something was standing not far from me. I don't know if it was some sort of intuition, but I just felt it. I looked at the forest floor, and I looked up, and felt that I was about to meet eyes with something. They weren't green, red, or any exaggerated color. They were just white, beady, and very round. 
They were almost glowing, staring endlessly ahead at me. I could see the shadows of its legs and I knew it was on all fours and somewhere around my height. I'm six foot two, so I was absolutely incensed at this point. How was a four-legged animal so dang tall? I was convinced that something else was happening here, some sort of prank maybe. But all those thoughts and speculations quickly kicked themselves out of my head when I heard a popping noise. You know that noise your ankles or knees will make when you stand up after sitting down for so long? It was like that, but times five. This happened not only once, but twice. Because that's when it stood up. I had instantly dropped the light. My, I was absolutely so scared I started running for my life, going as fast as I could in any direction that was not the direction this thing was in. I hurried to find my flashlight and when I did, I quickly shone it forward. I was extremely hesitant because I was scared of what I would see. All I saw were the white eyes, lean into the light, getting closer and closer to it. The first physical feature of the creature was unleashed, a giant wolf head that made itself clear for at least two seconds as I once again dropped the light out of scaredness and bolted across the field, past my tent and everything else and jumped into my car. I heard the sound of footsteps so loud and heavy behind me that I felt like the earth was going to open up and split open at any moment. I made it to the gravel path as I made it to my car. I practically threw myself into it. I stopped for only a second to realize that this could not be happening. There is no way I just saw what I did. But then, I quickly saw out of the corner of my eye, standing in the wood line, those glowing white eyes in the deep dark woods. I drove away never looking back, and I don't think I'll ever go camping there again. My Truly Haunting Camping Experience by Mark M. I am currently 24 years old, and this story took place many years ago. I don't quite remember my exact age, but I was probably in my late teens. I was camping with all guys from my family. Three brother-in-laws, three brothers, my dad, and myself. The camp was at Badger Lake near Mount Hood in Oregon. A small creek ran out of the artificial lake full of brook trout. I was fishing for them at the time and doing rather well. So about a mile down the stream, I decided to head back up to camp. Now this forest had a lot of animals around, lots of small and big game, but nothing necessarily too dangerous. I've always seen mountain lion prints here and there, especially in the mud by the lake when the water was low, and knew to keep my eye out for predators. But at the time, I only had a small 4 inch knife on hand. So as I walked up the creek, near the camp, not too far away from the lake, I came to a fork in the trail. One side, of course, going right up to the steep hills, and the left going over near to the camp and by the lake. Between the tracks, about six feet from one another, was a thick brush of berry bushes and young pine trees about five to eight feet tall. As I was walking down the trail, I heard heavy raspy breathing that was unmistakably from a bear. The moment I heard them, I froze instantly, thinking that if I made a noise, there was a chance that I might scare the bear off or scare him into charging through the brush directly towards me. I pulled out my 4-inch razor-sharp blade, thinking I may have a chance of cutting the bear's stomach open so that after he mauls me, he'll at least die or something. Then, I heard the bear grunt, noticed my presence, and there was an absolute silence. I stood there, knife in hand, heart racing, and praying that the bear would leave me for an easily 15-minute time span. Eventually, I felt safe enough to walk back to the camp quietly. I arrived at the camp, told everybody what had happened, and to this day, I don't set foot into the woods without a firearm, and I try not to go alone. You never know who or what you'll run into the woods, and it's best to keep some sort of self-defense on you, even if it's just a knife. Chilling Skinwalker Encounter by M. The image of this night is forever burned vividly in my memory. I was a 17-year-old girl living in a populated suburb near some woods. My friends and I loved to hang out and decided to have a sleepover in my front yard in a big tent. There were eight of us in total, and as we were loading all of our blankets, pillows, snacks, and all that good stuff into the tent, my one friend, 
whom we will call Pat, starts screaming, Skimwalker! Pat is very well versed in the knowledge of cryptids. She also knew much about skimwalkers as her grandma was full Navajo. She only tried to scare us a few times, and that's what I was assuming she was doing at this time, so all of us blew it off. But my friend Dre did not take it kindly. She was very spiritual and distraught. Now, fast forward to around 3 a.m. Let me set the scene for you. This tent had a mesh-like roof so you could see out of it. The only light, say from our phones, was the moon. Let me remind you that we live near a part of the Appalachian Mountain Range in Pennsylvania, and we are in a small suburban population of less than 1,000. At 3 a.m., we heard a strange noise come from down the street, and what sounded like clicking noises. We ignored it, thinking it was probably the, some sort of deer or some sort of animal or maybe just somebody messing with us. We did hear a lot of weird things out in the woods, and it was usual for deer to roam around the street at night. We did start noticing the clacking noises of feet, or hooves I should say, growing closer and closer. Then, all of a sudden, we heard a blood-chilling screech. At this point, we were all terrified. We prayed it was one of the local high rednecks messing with us. It wasn't, unfortunately. The noises that we were hearing before began to get louder, and they sounded more aggressive this time. We could tell that something was running at us because we could start hearing clacking noises, which would be hooves against the street coming towards us at an incredible rate. The creature had a foul smell. It smelled like rotting carcasses and crap. Through the mesh roof, we could see it. Finally, it looked over. It had huge antlers. It was easily 10 feet off the ground, with animal guts decorating its antlers. Then, its face. Its face was vomit-inducing. It had what looked like a moose or a deer head. Maybe a mix of both. But it was oddly, oddly wrong. Everything was just dislocated. The jaw was just hanging on by a hinge. The creature looked like it might have even been decaying. Its mouth was hanging open super wide, easily like a foot wide, unnaturally. It was lined with teeth that were incredibly sharp that could cut anything. The eyes were deep blood red and they seemed soulless. We tried not to scream as it was staring at us as to not put ourselves in further danger. Pat started whispering a Navajo prayer and when she finished, she said something that I could not understand. And then the creature continued to stare at us intently. It began to circle us for what felt like 30 minutes. It was snarling and snapping at the tent, but it seemed like it couldn't come any closer, almost like there was an invisible force field around us. Finally, my mom came outside with the dog to take him for a walk. My dog is a Rottweiler and a strong one too. The minute my mom saw this creature, she dropped the leash and ran inside to get the gun. But before she was back out, my dog had scared this thing off. She was a good girl and tough to the bone. My friends were sitting in shock, some crying, some not. When my mom returned, she checked on us and brought us all inside for the night. Not any of us slept a wink that night. Every noise made us jump. I'm now 22 years old, and I still have nightmares of that beast. The image of it is forever burned in my head. Thank you for sharing my story. The Creature in Upstate New York by Anonymous I'm a 16-year-old girl. This story happened around November of last year at my grandparents' house in upstate New York. Behind their house is farmland, and behind that are many acres of thick woods. There are several trails that have been created through these woods for walking or four-wheeling purposes. I've been going on these trails all my life, and have never truly felt that there is anything to be afraid of in there. I often listen to horror stories about being in the wilderness and sometimes wonder if I will encounter something scary, but I never thought I would. On the day this story takes place, we were at my grandparents' house to celebrate my aunt's birthday. Anytime we are there, me and my cousins always go into the woods to hang out and talk. This time, I only went into the woods with one of my cousins, Grace. As we breached the tree line, everything felt normal. However, when we were probably half a mile into the trail, something felt off. My instincts were telling me something was wrong. It felt different than the usual paranoia I mentioned earlier. It felt like I had a real reason to be afraid. 
I did not mention anything to Grace. I didn't want her to think that I was paranoid or anything like that. As we kept walking, the feeling just did not end. Further into our walk, I swear I heard movement within the trees. I start to feel like we are being watched, and alarm bells start going off in my head. I was about to tell Grace that I think we should turn back, but her attention was focused on the side of the trail in the trees. She stopped walking and said, What is that? while pointing into the trees. I tried to see what she was seeing, but I told her I could not see anything. Grace is taller than me, so perhaps she had a better vantage point than I did. Ah, oh, she said. There's a deer over there. She slowly creeps into the trees, trying to stay quiet. I told her I think we should go because I was still a little freaked out. She replied, telling me to stop talking so I would not scare away the deer. I could barely see her as she made her way close to the supposed deer that I could not see. I was looking around me because Grace's absence made me even more nervous. My heart sinks several seconds later as I hear a blood-curdling scream come from Grace and then the growing sound of crushing branches as she runs back towards the trail. She comes into view and I can finally see the thing she saw, and it is no deer. It was an extremely pale humanoid creature, but had a deer head, and it was pursuing her. I was frozen in place until Grace turned to the trail. She screamed for me to run, breaking my paralysis. I did not dare look behind me as we ran away from this creature, but I could still hear that it was chasing us. We managed to break through the trees into the field without it catching us. After that, I could no longer hear it until we reached the house. I believe what Grace and I encountered that day was a wendigo. It fits the physical description, but I also heard a video from Swamp Dweller recently about deer people, and I think it might even be that. We were in the Great Lakes region though, which is why I do think it might be a wendigo. I know that it could have caught us and killed us if it wanted to, but I still wonder why it did not. Grace and I have tried to tell our other cousins about it, but none of them really believe us. I hope they never have to experience what we did. One thing is for sure, I will never return to those woods. Scary Things Lurk in the Smokies by Anonymous I do not remember exactly how old I was at the time maybe 14 or 15 years old. I had this crazy guy that lived on my street. Everyone called him Crazy Mike. He really was as crazy as you'd imagine, but more on him in a minute. I had this one friend that was a little wild. Let us call him Charlie. He was kind of the adventurous friend that got me to do some crazy stuff. We went through a phase for about two or three months where we would hang out a lot and it was honestly a lot of fun. One of the things we would do is explore the nearby woods. There was a lot of wildlife, and anyone can go out there and explore as far as they wanted. We lived on a rather tall mountain, and we would hike up the mountain when we had enough time for the day. We would hike back down, and normally get back before dark. We normally took the regular roads back down because it was just a little bit easier to get home that way. My friend lived up a few roads from mine, so I would walk to his house with him and then go home by myself. I remember this one day, we had gone hiking through the creek. Bear in mind, it was freezing outside at the time, typical winter mountain. There was snow on the ground and a lot of water was frozen. At one point, we had the bright idea of walking on the ice. As you might imagine, we fell into the water. It was not very deep or anything, not even enough to go above our chest, but... We were dripping with water, and it was about 5 degrees outside, and there was snow on the ground. But being the crazy kids we were, it just did not stop us. We continued hiking even after we got soaking wet. I do not know if we had just high tolerance to the cold or if it was adrenaline. We were all good though. We continued for a couple of hours that day, but after a certain point, I finally talked him into heading home for the day. He agreed, and we went out and got on the road. We made our way back down like usual. But this is the point when I started freezing. I was too cold, and I knew my body was not going to make it back down. 
I knew that I was in danger, like getting near hypothermia or something. When we got to my friend's house, he was more than willing to let me come in and warm up for a few minutes. But just as we were getting to his house, my mom called me. She was angry with me because I had not answered my phone in probably more than an hour or so. I tried explaining the situation to her, but she just screamed at me repeatedly to come home. So I walked the rest of the way home, and that was that. This is where Crazy Mike comes in, because he lives one road above me, and it saves me about 10 minutes of walking if I cut through a part of his property to get to my house. He had a big fence, but so did his neighbor. There was a small walkway kind of area between the two spots. I was obviously in a rush to get home and warm up. In fact, I was jogging most of the way. I had not heard anything from Crazy Mike by that point, so I figured it would be okay if I cut through his property this one time. I started going through, and that was when he came out of his house with an assault rifle. He pointed it at me and started screaming at me like a maniac. Of course, I turned around and sprinted away. I ran all the way back home and told my mom. She honestly thought I was exaggerating and that I should not be cutting through people's property anyway. That was when I started asking people around the area about him. I heard some stories about Crazy Mike and some of the things that he would do. I heard that he was a conspiracy theorist, a drug dealer, a criminal, a felon, and a bunch of other stuff. If I had to sum it up all in one single phrase, a bad guy. Whoever I asked never had anything good to say about him, and the part that freaked me out was that I still had to pass Crazy Mike's house on my way home every single day. I did not have to cut through his property, but I did still have to walk in front of his house on the road to get to mine, and that made me uncomfortable, because now I was constantly worried that I was going to get shot or something. I still would go hiking with Charlie and all that up and through the mountains, but there was no incident for a while, so I thought that was going to be the end of it. However, I noticed something else. He had video cameras on the outside of his property, looking out onto the road. I had never noticed them before, but now that I was aware of his insanity, I paid a little bit more attention. Whenever I walked by, the cameras would follow me. What freaks me out the most was that they were manually operated cameras. They were not the kind of cameras to just follow motion around. He was sitting there operating those cameras every single time I ever walked by watching me. I'm not sure if he was recording all the footage or not, but he had made me uncomfortable either way. I remember there was one time when I was walking home from Charlie's house at night. It must have been around 10 or 11. It was rather late, and even then the cameras followed me as I walked by. I thought that was going to be it, that nothing was ever going to happen again between me and Crazy Mike. Well, I was dead wrong. It was still during the same winter season, and I was walking home during a blizzard. I know, that's just the kind of guy I was. My mom was going to order pizza that night and I did not want to miss it. I passed by Crazy Mike's like I always did, and that was when something unexpected happened. He had a giant fence and it had to have been 15 feet tall, and it was thick wood. Part of it was open, and a dog ran after me. I could not tell what kind of dog it was, but it was angry and barking at me loud. It ran after me and I could tell that it was going to bite me as hard as it could. I got a seriously violent vibe from that dog. I was lucky that I was in really good shape and managed to sprint away. I did not slip or anything else either. That situation could have turned bad fast. Anyway, my family ended up moving a few weeks later for unrelated reasons. My mom got a new job in a different state, so that was the end of my experience with Crazy Mike. And even now, I wonder what his problem was. Was he really a drug dealer or a criminal? Why was he so paranoid about having some kid walk in front of his house or cutting through a piece of his property? I've asked my friends on Facebook a couple of times if they have heard anything about Crazy Mike, and apparently nothing has changed. So, make of that what you will. I guess the moral of the story is, is there are some crazy mountain people out there, so be safe. Sometimes, walking in front of their house is enough to set them off. I'll Never Revisit the Smoky Mountains by Brian So I am not entirely sure if this will make it to the show, but this is an experience that happened to my husband and I while we were exploring the Great Smoky Mountains, more so the Blue Ridge Parkway on the North Carolina side. 
We are both super into missing 411 and like to creep each other out with stories of skimwalkers. Anyway, we are driving along the Blue Ridge Parkway, stopping at the many different overlooks and overall, it was gorgeous. We went back just a week ago, early November, and the weather was perfect. We had seen a few side roads, some named and some unnamed. I'm not 100% sure what possessed us to go off-road. We decided to take one of these unnamed roads. The road was gravelly. There was a bridge or tunnel that we had to go through. It was covered in graffiti, so we thought, oh, okay, people come through here, there's graffiti, so clearly we're not the only people who have been down here, and we continued. We came across these three open gates to three different roads. One to our left, one to our right, and one straight in the middle. The one to the left had a gate that swang outward, as if it were exit, and the other two swung inward like an entrance. So we chose the middle road and continued again. We started on down this road and suddenly the gravel turned to dirt and the road went from a decent size to a very slim one-lane road. If you have ever been in the mountains, you know that the roads can be nerve-wracking. Sharp curves, one side of the car facing the mountain and the other side clearly showing you a massive drop off the side of said mountain. Imagine all of that on this tiny road. If someone were coming up the road, I would have to back up. There was nowhere to turn. We went down this mountain for a good 20 minutes before we saw, on this dirt road, no bug sounds, no birds, absolutely nothing. There was a small turnoff. I decided to go down it thinking the road connected and took us back up. It probably did, but there was a stream going right over the part where the road was supposed to connect. There was a red truck on the other side of the stream, two guys watching us. They crossed over the stream and went past us, looking at us and nodding. I got a glimpse of one of the guys, and something about him felt off. I cannot explain it, but I got a nervous feeling deep in the pit of my stomach. Now, I do not have an off-road car. I have a Tiguan, a mini SUV. I do not even have four-wheel drive. None of this was a smart idea, I know. I decided I should not go over the stream in case my tires got stuck, and we did not have any cell phone service, so we would not be able to call for help if the car did get stuck, so we decided to turn around. I am a master at three-point turns. This day, however, my husband had a feeling he should get out and help me turn around. I kept having this nervous feeling and did not want him to get out of the car, but he insisted, and so he did. He helped me turn around with ease and got back in the car, and we went back up the little side road, deciding whether to go back up the mountain to where we came in or keep going down. It was then that he told me he saw something in the stream as we drove down it, and that is why he wanted to get out and see what it was. It was a piece of metal, like sheet metal, like part of a broken guardrail, and it was sticking out of the ground like it was intentionally put there. There were no guardrails anywhere near us, there was no reason for there to be a chunk of metal stuck in the ground. We were surrounded by trees and nature, not a single metal structure anywhere near us that could explain why this was there. He said after that he got an uneasy feeling. He didn't tell me any of this until we were back in our cabin, safe and sound. But for some dumb reason, we continued to keep going down this stupid mountain. We continued down the road for a little bit longer, thinking we were going to reach a bottom point and go back up the mountain and come out through the other gate. No, we reached a house. A single white house. Not abandoned, just sitting there, hidden behind a bunch of trees, and at the near base of this mountain. I looked at my husband, who looked at me, who looked back at this house, and we said, no, we gotta get out of here. We looked at the road ahead of us, and it continued to go down. Like, how much further down can you go from the base of this mountain? I have no idea because when I saw that steep decline, where the road continued to go further and further down, I noped out. I turned the car around and we started driving back up this mountain. I want to mention that the further we drove this road, the quieter and darker it kept getting. It was 3pm on a super sunny day and the forest we were surrounded by on this mountainside was not very dense. I could look up and see blue sky clearly, but around us was this feeling of eerie and darkness. It was not a good feeling. Even as we turned and made our way up the mountain again, 
my husband was worried about other cars coming down, but I looked at the road and noticed our tire tracks were the only ones on this road. I got this immense feeling of being watched. I kept looking in my rear view, thinking I was going to see someone or something, maybe even that red truck from earlier coming up at us, but there was nothing, and I could not shake the feeling that something was watching us and was not happy that we were around. It was not until we were back at the top of the mountain where the road began we had heard birds again, heard the chirp of insects, and everything lightened back up. The air felt less thick, but our anxiety, that stayed heavy for a couple of days after this. After this happened, we went to our cabin and looked up similar stories. We looked up a map of the area and tried to see if there were any missing people or any weird things that have gone around. Tons of people have gone missing in that area, and we felt so stupid for being so careless. Thankfully, we are safe now, and just thinking about this sends shivers down my spine. Because what if we had kept going? What if I ran over that metal thing and busted my tires? What if the red truck came chasing after us? For anyone interested, or can find more information on what we experienced, we were in between Jenkins Ridge Overlook and Big Witch Gap on the Blue Ridge Parkway. International Waters by SDS19 I would like to share a brief but creepy story about a time I was sailing in international waters. I wished to keep where I was private as it was not entirely legal to be there at the time. I was sailing and enjoying my day in the fresh sea breeze. I was around 24 years old when this happened. I'm 30 years old now. While sailing, I was enjoying a few shots of whiskey which I know is incredibly irresponsible. I should note I can hold my alcohol rather well. I didn't do more than three shots before a sudden impact from below the boat knocked the glass out of my hand. The effect was enough to jolt the ship, making me look around to see if I had hit anything nearby. As I scanned around and below me, I saw nothing. A few minutes go by and, and I slowly start to ease back into a relaxed state. Although I can't quite explain what was happening, I'm confident the time to worry has passed. I settle back down, clean up my broken shot glass, and pull another out to drink the fourth shot. As I am about to drink, I hear a loud and profoundly unsettling moan from below. Moan is the best way I can describe it, as it was pretty loud. No sooner do I try to gather my senses and drop my whiskey, sad waste, do I feel a thud from the bottom of the boat that is hard enough to lift us off the water for just a moment. I fall to the bottom of the ship, scramble up and look around again. At first, I don't see anything. A few seconds later, though, I see the outline of a massive creature underneath the boat. It looks like it's swimming underneath the boat, and although I don't know what the hell it is, it's big enough to leave a shadow farther than I can see while looking down. This monster speeds up, and as it does, I can feel the boat being pulled with it a bit. I can feel the boat spin, and I try to keep it straight as the creature pulls ahead. It wasn't long before I see these big, black, almost spike-like scales somewhat surface from the water. I'm in absolute shock, pull out some binoculars, and I look at the rankings, which have sharp, almost quill or spike-like designs before they go back under the water again. I sat there completely unsettled on the water for a moment, before I could finally return to my senses, get my boat turned around, and head back for land. I'm not sure what the heck I saw but I'm pretty sure it wasn't a whale or anything like that that we've discovered so far. It's something far different. It looked... it looked like a dinosaur. A Safari I Won't Ever Forget by Anonymous My story isn't necessarily the most terrifying, but it's downright strange and has me scratching my head to this day. I went on a safari with my wife when we were 35, and it was an extraordinary experience. The first day came and went quickly. We enjoyed a lovely tour and we got to see everything from lions to hippos. It was indeed an eye-opening experience being out in the wilderness and another country so far away from home. The hospitality was simply the kindest, and I'm grateful for every moment of this trip. Well, on the first night of the trip, I slept hard. It was then I had a dream. In the dream, 
I had a child with my wife. At this point, my wife and I had been trying for years and could never have a child. I woke the next day somewhat happy from the dream, but also saddened at the thought we didn't have children. Coming out of the camp, I explained to my wife my goal. One of the guides heard my story and, with a smile, said before the end of this trip, you and she will be with child. I laughed and figured the guy was just trying to make us feel better. I was also a tad embarrassed, he interjected, with such a notion as it seemed that it meant he expected we would make love while camping one night. Trying to change the subject, I smiled and we continued on the safari. On night two, my wife talked to me about trying. I laughed and said, with all these people camping out here with us? She gave me a mischievous smile, the kind she always gave me in the past when she was up to something, and said it would be exciting. I told her that when we got home from the safari, we could make love as much as we wanted, but not with everyone so close in other tents. My wife seemed disappointed, but reluctantly we went to sleep. The third day of the safari was terrific. The whole trip had been pretty great. The previous night I had a dream. I was making love to my wife. I could hear a child's cries in a hospital, and then I woke up. The morning I woke up, I was greeted with a smile as the same tour guide as before shook his head approvingly and said tonight. I wasn't sure what to think and spent the rest of the day enjoying the safari until nightfall. Then my wife came to me heavily and kept goading me. I eventually decided to stop worrying and we had a great night. One thing led to another and finally we crashed, smiling the whole way. That night I had a bizarre dream. It had the other guy in it, but he was wearing some sort of native garb and smiling at me. He told me that I'd have a boy and hugged me. Upon waking, my wife shared her dream and relayed it verbatim. This was incredibly strange, but as soon as we came out of our tent and prepared to head back, I noticed the man was nowhere to be found. I asked one of our tour guides where the guide went, and the man looked at me perplexed momentarily and then asked me what he looked like. I gave him a description, and he simply smiled and said that he wasn't a tour guide. He is what Americans might call a spirit of some kind. He often comes to those who will soon be expecting. A few weeks after our trip, having not attempted relations after the fact, my wife took a pregnancy test and found out she was indeed pregnant. We eventually had a baby boy who is now five years old. We are grateful every single day for the good luck, fortune, and whatever happened with that spirit, I don't know how to explain it, but friends, that was the oddest and most crucial vacation I have ever and will ever take. Why You Should Avoid Being a Park Ranger by Anonymous. I don't know how many of you believe in demons or the supernatural, but I was a skeptic for most of my life, including my time as a park ranger. That is until the summer of 2013, when I had the oddest experience I have ever had in my lifetime, even today. For this story, you can call me Hank. I work as a state park ranger in Alabama. I've been doing this job for 14 years and have seen every manner of wildlife you could imagine. The things I'm going to describe are strange. I know how crazy they'll sound, but I assure you this is exactly what I saw. Anyway, I started my shift like any other. I did some cleaning, made some repairs, and had a chat with some of the locals. Growing up, I had always loved nature, so it was natural that I got a job as a park ranger. If you love nature, it's one of the most important things you can do, and it's the most important job you can get. After lunch, I patrol the area and watch the wildlife. It was while walking that I heard something behind me. I turned around and I saw a dog. You're probably going to tell yourself right now, Oh, that's so sweet, a doggy. You're probably mentally petting the dog right now, right? Well, trust me, you wouldn't want to rub this thing. It looked like a Doberman, but its fur was all black. This dog sat on all fours and was my height. Keep in mind, I'm six foot two. I remember being weirded out by thinking, okay, someone lost their dog. The thing is, though, I couldn't see anyone nearby. The vibes this dog gave off were absolutely creepy. It wasn't just its unnatural height, but an almost dead sort of feeling that hung around. Like, I would compare it to dread and the fear of death put together. It was just emanating from this thing. I slowly approached the dog anyways in hopes that I could find its owner or help it out. Despite my feelings about the dog, it's just an animal and I'm an animal lover. As I approached the dog, it got up and left. The dog moved quickly and I could not keep up with it. I reported seeing this dog to a few of the other rangers and they said they'd keep an eye out. 
The remainder of my shift was pretty mundane. A few weeks pass, and I see the dog again while I'm on another patrol. It's a bit far away, just sitting on all fours and staring. It wasn't staring at me per se, but more like it was overlooking the park itself. I was curious and radioed out that I'd spotted the dog again. The second I'd radioed this, the dog looked in my direction. I'm not talking it quickly turned its way and looked at me. I mean, it literally, with this most unusual calm, deliberate, and slow head turn, looked at me. It got up, ran, and then was gone. I told the other rangers where it was, tried to get the exact locations, but I don't know, I don't think they ever found it. We decided we'd go about our business and keep an eye out once again. The rest of the work week came and went. For the next two weeks, there was no sighting of the dog. Then, on a Tuesday morning in August, something very odd happened. I saw this dog again. It reappeared in a hurry. I quickly ran in the direction I saw the dog move and radioed to the other rangers I could see the dog again. It didn't take long for everyone to meet up and just up the hill the dog sat there. It's back to us, looking down at something. We rushed up the hill and looked over to see someone lying on their back motionless. We immediately called the paramedics and I ran around to start CPR. I tried with all my might to help this person but I believe they were just too far gone. The paramedics arrived to find a lifeless body and many of us looking sullen and distraught. I remember trying to hold back tears and repeating that I tried over and over. I'm sure I was a bit of a mess, but as I was brought over to be checked out by paramedics, I remember someone trying to question me. It all tuned out in my head. You know how in the movies, during scenes of trauma, how sometimes people will be talking and it's like mute to the character. That's the best way I can describe that moment. I could see the paramedics' lips moving, but no sound was coming out. I was thinking about way too many things at that moment. Many of them jumbled as I was in shock, but I came to rather quickly when I saw something even more shocking. Up on the hill, the dog stood there. Next to the dog was a woman in a black dress. My first thought of this dog was that maybe that was the owner, and he did have, you know, a family after all. That's when I saw something I couldn't even begin to believe. Despite seeing it with my own eyes, I still don't believe it. The body we found was a woman. A woman is currently being taken away to the morgue. It was a young jogger who looked like she could be in her early 30s with blonde hair and a long ponytail. I never forget her blue eyes as they stared at me from the hill. She looked comfortable, relaxed even. I remember staring and pointing at the mountain, but no words would come out of my mouth. I wanted to scream, but I couldn't get a word out. The paramedics looked into the distance, but didn't seem to see anything. I, however, saw the dog, the woman in black, and the jogger. I also watched them turn and walk away until I could see them no longer. I tried running up the hill. I looked high and low until I was eventually rounded up again by the police and paramedics, and I found no sign of anyone. I tried to explain what I saw, when I could finally speak again and make sense. I was probably told it was probably a side effect of my shock, and I probably didn't actually see anything. I'm pretty sure what I saw was real and I'm unsure of how to explain it. It was quickly the strangest series of events I've ever experienced. I still work with the park rangers and I love my job. I haven't seen the dog or the woman since, and I have no idea what more to say. My Days Working in Forest Agriculture by T.D. I worked in forest maintenance and forest ag for quite some time. Some friends of mine owned a big plot of land in the Rocky Mountains. A group of us, all guys between 18 and 38 years of age, would gather together several times a year, go into the mountains for several days, and clear shrub brush, make fire breaks, and when appropriate, cut Christmas trees. This particular time it was early spring, and our crew of nine on three Gator four-wheel drive vehicles were about 9,200 feet in elevation up on this mountain. There was a significant amount of snow on the ground. We had put in a long day's work and we were headed to camp until the old guy of the crew asked if we wanted to lead to some place called the slope. This was a near treeless slope free of large rocks about 100 yards wide with tracks of giant trees on either side. We would tow a tube downhill in the snow using one of the gators. It was actually a lot of fun. We got to the slope, set up a fire pit, cracked open the whiskey, and started having a great time. We all took several turns being towed. Jeff was the new guy and the youngest at 18. We were giving him the craziest rides, swinging him close to the trees to freak him out. 
an initiation of sorts. It was about 1 a.m. pitch black except for our dying fire and lightly snowing. Not the smartest or the safest thing I've ever done, but one of the most fun. Just as we were wrapping up one of the last rides and heading back to camp, Jeff freaked the hell out. He was stumbling over his words and couldn't express himself very clearly. But finally, he got the words out of him three-fourths of the way down. He had seen a man standing a few yards into the woods. He said he was wearing a trapper's hat, one of those with the flipped up bill and the ear flaps like in Fargo, and a plaid Mackinac. We were all skeptical. We were all on a big plot of private property at elevation that was somewhat hostile, but we took the rifles off the gators, got our flashlights out, and looked around. We didn't find anything, not even footprints. We chalked it up to the inexperienced, spooky environment, and of course the whiskey, and headed back to the camp about an eighth of a mile away. Jeff didn't sleep all night, he was convinced he actually saw someone. The following day, we drove the gators to the house on the property, got in our trucks, and headed to town, which was not very far, for some nice breakfast. We had our breakfast and were heading back to the property to say our goodbyes and go our separate ways. As we neared the intersection of the public dirt road and the private dirt drive to the house, there were several police cars and ambulances. We stopped to talk to the police who informed us the closest neighbors had found a body in the ditch. As they were heading down the mountain, police had followed in reverse footprints up the hill to the slope and then came across the neighboring property to another perpendicular road. They asked if we saw anything, and we told them about the Mackinac man. Sure enough, it was him. Self-inflicted gunshot probably just minutes after we encountered him. I still don't know what he wanted, if he was dangerous, or if we could have helped. Poor Jeff got his whiskey and meals paid for for the next several weeks. What did we encounter? By Anonymous. For a little backstory, Daniel was my childhood best friend from my neighborhood, and he lived in the building next to mine in the year of 1993, if I remember correctly. But we all called him Dan for short. This is his story, and he swears it's totally true. Since Dan was eight or nine years old, his mother, his stepfather, and he moved to a small neighborhood in a city in South America, which is located in a valley and is surrounded by a mountain and woods on all sides. The neighborhood was on the east side of the city on a dead-end street of a closed neighborhood, but there were a lot of green areas all around it, such as small hills with big and small trees, plants, flowers, grass, two parks, and a sports court. When Dan and his family moved to the neighborhood, he was very happy because when they were getting there in his mom's car, he could see lots of places where he could play in and explore. So as a kid, that was a very exciting thing. Even though the hills, woods, and plants that surrounded Dan's new neighborhood looked really nice during the day and while the sun was up, they looked very dark and creepy at night, and he thought they were really scary. He felt an ominous presence from those woods at night. At that age, Dan was afraid of many things, like the dark, the woods, wolves, black dogs, cats, spiders, sharks, you name it. Just like me, and this was because he was a total mama's boy. And at five years old, what do you expect? When Dan and I met for the first time, we were both playing in the park while our babysitters were watching us and talking to each other. We immediately bonded and became friends because we had a lot of things in common. We started talking about our favorite TV shows and movies such as Star Wars, Dragon Ball Z, the X-Men cartoons, and Ninja Turtles, among many others. So, we used to play by pretending we were superheroes or some sort of cartoon character while running around, using the merry-go-round, the slides, the swings, and funny enough, we both had plastic lightsabers. So we fought as if we were Jedis or Ninja Turtles, but we never stayed in the park once the sun went down either because our sisters did not let us, or we were just too scared, honestly. However, Dan was not my only friend in the neighborhood. I introduced him to my other friends who lived in my building and other buildings and houses. Their names were the following. Eliza, Diego, JP, Mike, Laura, and Gerard. All of us were around the same age, and we all became great friends as the months went by because almost every afternoon we played sports, played in the park, trick-or-treated, had water balloon fights, played Nintendo together, 
climb the hills and woods behind our buildings during the day, and even did everything together. The neighborhood kids liked to joke around by saying that the woods behind the buildings were haunted. At that time, we played hide and seek or cops and robbers, so we ran around the street until 7 p.m. because that was our curfew, and we had to do our boring homework after that. But Dan and I went to bed late at night in secret while we talked quietly on the phone. That night, it was like 9 or 10 p.m. I think, Dan asked me the following. Did you watch X-Men today? Yeah, dude, of course. I would not miss it for the world. Did you see the fight against Apocalypse and the Four Horsemen? Yeah, dude. That fight was awesome. I loved it. But talking about something else, have you heard some creepy noises behind your building at night? Nah, bro, I'm a deep sleeper, so I usually black out. Wow, I wish I was that lucky. You know, I usually can hear footsteps in those woods at night, and I also sleepwalk sometimes. Well, I think it's time for me to go to sleep. See you tomorrow. Take care, bro. Sure thing, man. Talk to you tomorrow. Take care. Dan hung up his favorite hamburger-shaped phone, sat down in bed, grabbed an old fantasy book about dragons that was on his nightstand, and started reading it until he began to close his eyes and doze off. He fell into a deep sleep and was now dreaming, or so he thought. In his dream, Dan could hear the crickets in the forest, but was woken up by some strange steps walking around the forest and the leaves crunching beneath him, or as if some person or animal was walking in the woods. There are a lot of cats in the neighborhood, so he thought it was one of those cats potentially, maybe a possum or an owl. All of a sudden, he heard a low whisper that beckoned him and said, Daniel, it's Professor X. The X-Men need your help. Come to the woods and help us. This strange but yet familiar voice was very similar to the professor's voice from his favorite cartoon, and it sounded like it was right outside of his window. Since he was a naive and innocent child, he decided to get out of bed, put on his jacket and boots, took his glasses, got out of his apartment, and went to the ground floor. Once he was on the ground floor, he walked to his building's parking lot. He felt a little cold, so he rubbed his shoulders with his hands. The voice kept calling out to him, Help the X-Men, Dan. Somehow, he felt extremely attracted to this voice, like metal to a magnet, because he could not get it out of his head. He took a small leap to get on top of a small hill. He then felt very scared, but kept walking into the dark and creepy woods. While he was walking, he heard other footsteps and leaves crunching beside his. He felt like these steps were approaching his position. At that moment, he stopped walking so he could hear the steps more clearly since he thought it was some crazy person or an animal that was insane enough to walk in the woods in the middle of the night. There are a lot of cats in this neighborhood, like I said, so Dan thought it was one of those cats. Maybe it was some other sort of animal, but then he heard a noise that sounded like a roar. He thought it sounded very similar to those dinosaurs from Jurassic Park. He had recently seen that movie in theaters, so it was the closest thing he could think of. Suddenly, he heard fast steps from somebody or something running in his direction. Dan broke out of his trance. He looked around, and his little kid's mind felt so terrified that he passed out and fortunately when he hit the ground, his body was positioned between a tall tree and a large boulder. So, he barely heard how this trickster creature ran next to him, circled his location, and then it smelled the air in order to get a scent, but he guessed it decided to leave. Dan assumed... He had passed out for several hours because he was woken up by the sound of a woodpecker, cicadas, and birds that were on a nearby tree. The heat and glare from the sun in his face woke him up. He rubbed his eyes, opened them, and looked all around him. He was in shock and horrified when he looked at his Spider-Man watch and saw that it was 6 a.m. He had woken up in the middle of the forest. He thought he was going to wake up in his bed because he was dreaming, but he had sleepwalked into the forest in order to follow that beckoning voice. He saw his clothes were full of fallen leaves, so Dan quickly stood up, brushed the leaves from his arms and legs, and ran away from that creepy forest, which looked normal during the day. He climbed down the forest until he got into his parking lot. He ran to his building's door, opened it, ran to the elevator, and he saw himself in the mirror and could not believe that happened to him. Dan got to his apartment door, opened the door silently, tiptoed inside the apartment's hallway, and saw that thankfully his mother and father had not waken up yet. So... He went to bed and stood at the ceiling, trying to process what occurred last night. He completely believed his parents when they told him not to listen to strangers, 
especially if they are in the middle of a dark and creepy forest. So, Dan had many questions and thought to himself, how did this creature imitate Professor X's voice? How did it know he would listen to it? How did it know he loved the X-Men cartoon? Maybe he would never find out, or maybe he would. Who knows? Central Virginia Spookiness by Janie Bow. I grew up in a densely forested rural area in Central Virginia, and like most kids my age, 10 at the time of this story, I spent a lot of time playing in and around the woods. My best friend and I found a creek one day while exploring different deer trails through the woods. This creek we happened upon was a rare find, and the perfect spot for us to play. It was wide and deep enough to swim around in, and had nice, soft mossy banks on either side to rest on after we had tired ourselves out. The water was cool and clear, with no copperheads and no mosquitoes because the water was constantly running. We were psyched. After a few hours of swimming, we had to walk back home for lunch, but made plans to pack lunch the next day so we could have a picnic on the creek banks and spend the whole day there. The next morning, we set up for the woods at around 1 p.m., planning to have the picnic first and swim after. We entered at the same spot we had the previous day and followed what we thought was the same deer trail. It was not. At the point where we should have found the creek, we walked into a small clearing that was covered in a huge thick ferns. We had never walked past this before, so being both hungry and tired of walking, we both decided to eat in the clearing. We laughed and played around there for a little while, spitting watermelon seeds at each other from our lunch. It was an absolute blast and we were both in wonderful giddy moods. That all changed, however, as soon as we packed up and set out to find the creek. As we walked on, the woods started to feel darker and colder. We got skittish, and I noticed my friend kept whipping her head around to look behind us. After about an hour of walking, we came upon what looked like an entire overgrown bathroom. The sink, toilet, and bathtub all sitting arranged together and covered in ivy. It is common to find weird stuff like this in the middle of the woods, so we just walked on and made jokes to lighten the mood, calling it Bigfoot's bathroom. After another hour of walking and not seeing anything we recognized, we started to panic. Instead of trying to reach the creek, we were now just trying to find our way back home, or out of the woods at least. I told her we should follow the sun, and eventually we would come up upon a road or someone's property where we could find help. She insisted on trying to find another way, and we began yelling at each other out of fear, and let's be honest, little girl bossiness. I told her if she thought she was so right, she should just go on her way, and we would see who got out first, so we split up. Now, as an adult, I can fully acknowledge I was being a stubborn brat, and a bit of an idiot. The worst possible thing we could have done was split up. Not even ten minutes after splitting up, I began to hear someone walking maybe 100 feet behind me. Thinking it was my friend deciding to go my way after all, I slowed down so she could catch up to me. Instead, whatever it was matched my pace. I slow down, it slows down. I stop it stops. This went on for what felt like hours. The whole time I was going back and forth on whether it was in my head or it was really something following me. I picked up a big stick, swung it a few times to make sure it was sturdy, just to make sure that if I had to hit somebody with it, it would last, and trucked on. As it began to get dark, I came upon something that made my heart sink into my stomach. It was Bigfoot's bathroom. I had just walked in a huge circle for hours, despite being 100% sure I was following the sun west the entire time. Confused and frustrated, I sat down on a log and just screamed my little heart out while smacking my sticks together repeatedly into the ground. As I tried to collect myself, I heard footsteps again, walking up on from behind me. I called out my friend's name, as loud as I could but got no answer. Then, after a short pause, the steps began to run towards me. I jumped up and booked it as fast as I could in the opposite direction. Now, 
This is truly the horrifying part which I typically omit while telling people this story. As I was sprinting through the darkening woods, I began to hear what I thought were church bells. I looked up to see the darkest, deepest cloud I have ever seen in my life. In the middle of it, it was so black, like it was looking into the night sky, and the dark gray around it seemed to be swirling. It gave me a horrible feeling to look at, almost like nausea. What sickened me further is that I realized the sound of the bells were coming through the hole in the cloud. They were definitely loud. I mean, really booming out of this thing. When I realized this, I stopped dead in my tracks. I felt a sense of absolute and overwhelming dread that has gone unmatched in all my 24 years on this planet. Something in my head began screaming that if I do not run away from whatever the hell that cloud was, no one would ever see me again, and I would be gone. I did not want to run toward the thing, chasing behind me either though, so I made a sharp right and took off away from both. It was now completely dark, and I was running blindly through the trees smacking through branches, wheezing and tripping every few feet for what seemed like another hour, until I smacked into something low and flew over it, hitting the ground so hard that the air in my lungs was knocked out of me. As I lay there trying to recover, I realized I could not hear the bells anymore. Then my eyes adjusted to the dark, and I realized what had just made me go ass over teeth. It was an old fence. Grabbing hold of it, I prayed that it would lead me to a farm, and sure enough, it did. I walked up over a hill about a mile to get to the farmhouse, explained what had happened, and the farmer graciously gave me a ride back home. I was covered head to toe in scrapes, oozing blood, and was more exhausted than I had ever been in my entire life, but I was finally safe. It was past 9pm when I finally walked through the front door. My friend had gotten back home shortly after we split and figured I had as well, so I hadn't told anybody I was lost, and my family just figured I was still out after dark, which wasn't very uncommon for me. They were shocked when I walked in beat up and crying. No one had been looking for me at all. To this day, I wonder how long they would have waited to come find me if I had not been lucky enough to find the fence, and if it would have been too late.